and welcome to the buzz about books. Right now joining me I have uh, the wonderful Matt Thorne to talk about his book, Prince. Um, welcome Matt, how's it going? Okay, yeah, good. Um, so you have spent seven years of your life uh, researching uh, all about Prince. Yeah, I realised I should probably yeah. stop doing it <laughs> when I realised I've been working on the book longer than The Revolution were together as a band before oh they broke up. Oh my goodness. So it's a start. really fat book though and you've, do you've definitely done a lot of research and I'm suspecting that you're a little bit of a fan, right? Well, just yeah, from, sure. Just from I the mean, amount of research and extensive information you've got in here, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, I mean, I was a fan before I started work on it, um. but I actually became more of a fan as, as I went on. Um, and, I, and it's opposite the process I think most people find when they're, they're spending a lot of time writing mm. about somebody. Most people reach a point where they're That's absolutely exactly. sick of somebody, yeah, but I, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't really get to that point while I was, it was working on it. It was the opposite. Um, you've written um, like a lot of fiction before, and this was this like one of your first non-fiction this books? Is, yeah, absolutely, my first non-fiction. Uh, and what, what was that like? Um, I, I'd written right. some journalism before, but I'd never written a long-form non-fiction project, and actually it was... Uh, it was pretty hard. I, s I spent the first two years really, um, it wasn't so much about the research then, but finding the right voice mm. for the book, particularly with music books, because there's so many different tones you can take with music books. I mean, you can be very analytical or you, yeah. can, you can get into the life or um, to how much you appear in the book is something that's quite controversial. Some people don't mm. like writers who make themselves very present in the book. Other, other people really like that. And well, how do you think yours is different from the other ones? Um, I think it's different in the way it concentrates on the work. I mean, that's the main yeah. focus for me. I mean, there are there is stuff about his life and, and details in his life, but I didn't want to uh, focus too much on that because there's yeah. just such a body of work and he's such a prolific person that even just concentrating uh, on the work um, just takes so much time and space. Yeah, and um, did you have um, good access to his friends and family and people you worked with or... Who, who did you access for it to get yeah, the there's information? A, there's a lot of interviews in the, yeah. in the book. Um, mainly from uh, former band members, people who've worked with him. I wanted to concentrate on the people who were, who were involved in the music, people yeah. like Wendy and Lisa. Yeah. Um, they're two of the, the, the more significant ones. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's people who, all the way through his career, from, from the very beginning, people like Chris Moon, um, right up until to um, people uh, really late on mm. who had still worked on it as well. So the en engineers uh, later on, uh, uh, but actual musicians as well, all the way through the book. And uh, one of the perks of the job was obviously going to all the concerts. And how many concerts would you say you went to all in all, like during your research period? Uh, well, there were lots yeah. during the research period. I mean, the main thing was when he was doing the 21 nights in London. And I yeah. went to uh, 19 of the main shows and, and 40, uh, 14 of the after shows. Funnily, you were disappointed that you missed two. I was disappointed. <laughs> I had to, I had so to... you've definitely become a mega fan now. Well, when you, yeah. yeah. I mean, then, then, <laughs> And then I saw him uh, at his house, and then I saw him in LA a few times, mm. uh, and in New York a couple of times as well. So, I mean, all of those were shows happening. Oh, and, and France as well. So, I mean, when, when I was working on the book, I, I sort of started to see him more and more, but that's because I wanted to write about the live yeah. performance and how the live performance differ differs in the book as well. How would you explain his live perfor performance compared to like some other artists who is almost you know on the same level as him? I mean, what's I think, the difference? I think the big thing is how different the shows can be. I mean, yeah. all, the problem with uh, all big artists who are doing big shows like that, like say he's playing the O2 and he's playing to twenty thousand people, is that he has to have a kind of hit space set. Yeah. But even within that environment, he manages to mix it up and do lots of different things. But then the after shows are completely unique, and I think he's the only real. Uh, artists of his stature who can do that, who can play for two or three hours a main show and then go and do an after show for another two hours or two and a half hours and do completely different things every mm. night. And I mean, that for me, that's extraordinary. And he's, he's this odd combination of being a very mainstream, uh, popular musician yeah. and almost like a kind of indie band as well at the same time because yeah. he's doing these, or, or an experimental jazz band in a way because you're getting yeah, all these yeah. unusual extra shows where he's doing stuff that's completely different and is, is aimed at a much smaller audience. Yeah, it's amazing that he can be so incredibly kind of niche with some things, yeah. jazzy, and then yeah. he can be very main. He's managed to do that really well. Yeah. And his, um, you know, reading it, you realise how much archive material he has, which oh, he's absolutely. probably forgotten about, and yeah, it's no, probably sure. genius stuff in there, and yeah, you don't yeah. even know about yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to write a lot about that stuff as well, because it's so important to the, the listeners, and it's, it's so different to um, a lot of musicians, because usually when you get into the world of... Yeah. of, of unreleased material it's usually quite obscure it's not very interesting but with Prince's stuff some of his poppiest stuff is, is, is unreleased stuff um, and you know there, there, there's so much of it that um, it could still come out and people could still 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 love it later on um, Brent Fisher uh, is one of the people I interviewed who, who worked on some of the orchestral arrangements with his father Claire Fisher 
um, was saying that it's not going to be like the Beatles when you discover one unreleased track later yeah. on. People are going to discover at some point when Prince chooses to make it available, if and when he chooses to make it available, hundreds, literally hundreds of songs. So, uh, all of which are, or a vast majority of which are of a very high standard. So I do think at some future point there will be a kind of reappraisal. And I was hoping that my book would be one of the ways in which people could find out about some of those, those songs as well. Hopefully in the future there won't be some boy band singing something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like One Direction singing something from Prince's arm. Archive. Oh, I dread to think. <laughs> the one thing that I realised about Prince, because you know this was an education for me, was mm -hmm. you know, I was listening to all his songs as I was reading the book, and um, it's just amazing. Like some of the content he comes out with, like some of his stuff's very controversial, and I didn't realise that because I listened to his more you know mainstream, sure, yeah. you know Cream, yeah, Get yeah. Off, Sign of the yeah, Times, yeah, that type of yeah, thing, yeah, but. Yeah. Well, some of the he's got a song called Sister. Yeah. Uh, do you want to explain a bit about well, that? that? I mean, like, that's that was a, kind that, of that is an officially released one. It's <laughs> on on Dirty Mind, one of his earlier albums, mm. and it was a very it was I think it's uh, a time where he was mm. he was being having a kind of punk influence in what he was mm. doing and and trying to be uh, very controversial. He's talking about pushing the envelope with those kind of songs. That's the phrase he kind of uses when he's talking about that kind of music. Um, and I think there was just a, uh, a desire. To, to, to sort of confront people. But the thing is, it's a very fun song as well at the same yeah, time. You yeah. know, it's not, I mean, when he's, he's singing about extreme subject matter, um, he always does it in a very appealing way. You know, yeah. It's not done to, to upset or shock people. Uh, it's done to make you think, I can't believe he's doing that, and then enjoying that kind of outrageousness. I mean, in a way, it's the sort of thing that lots of, uh, you find it more in, in rap music now, that, that he's, he was doing that in a kind of early way. Yeah, because you don't really see that much from mainstream artists really experimenting and taking a risk like that. Because I don't know, you can't. I don't can't think of any other artists who'd really push it like that. No, I'm trying I to think. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, sometimes people do it visually. You know, obviously mm. you've got Miley Cyrus, who's called. Yeah, and that's shocking. You know, that's shocking that enough. Yeah. Yeah, but not. But often not in yeah. the content. I mean, that's one of the things about um, the new generation of, of, of pop stars like mm. Miley Cyrus or Lady Gaga. You know, there's a lot of shock in the. Uh, in the image that they're using, but not in the music itself. There isn't there isn't that kind of lyrical shockingness in the same way. I mean, that was what what Prince is, is brilliant at. Uh, was he was writing songs that dealt with controversial content as well as having a. Uh, um, uh, an image that sort of challenged people. I have to say, I was watching. Um, <laughs> going off topic, I was watching <laughs> Big Brother yesterday, and I really swear, Dappy, Dappy, you know the guy uh, from. Yeah, no, no, I've been I think it. he is actually trying to be like Prince. <laughs> I really do. I think that he's not doing it very well, but he's trying. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of artists who are very influenced by him and want to be shocking like him. But he's such a true artist. Yeah. In the really true sense of the word. I mean, you really realise that when you listen to his whole. Archive, yeah, not his yeah. Is it his archive material, all his albums? Yeah, the, sure. I the mean, B sides yeah, and all yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, you realize that. I but. mean, well, I think the thing is that uh, one of the, what the thing people often get wrong when they're trying to to use that kind of shocking influence is that um, Prince has always had that kind of duality that he's a very conservative figure in mm. lots of ways as well. So although he'll be very, he might be shocking about sexual um, subject matter, a lot of the time he's, he's singing very religious songs where he's singing mm. about his, his Christianity. Um, and that kind of that, I mean, that adds to the kind of sh the shock and, and confusion of it, you know. So if, if it's just yeah. somebody being outrageous for uh, outrageous sake, I mean, you know, I love that as well. But it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have a lasting impact. It doesn't really have any any kind of like um, continued uh, resonance in the culture. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge with us. It's no a really problem. fascinating read, and I would recommend everyone to listen to music while they're reading it as well. Absolutely. Um, so thanks, thanks for coming no in. No problem. Matt. Thanks for having uh, me. So that is Matt Thorne's book, Prince.